Open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm going to read for just a few moments. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6. It says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Let me read that again. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. I want to talk about the the tests of being in the faith. Somebody say the test of being in the faith. This particular passage of scripture from the Apostle Paul is written to the church in Corinth. It is his second letter to them and he's writing it to them because the church is a mess. We got a little bit of everything in the church. Matter of fact, he, in the previous chapter, he says, I'm afraid to come because I'm afraid of what I might find. Contentions, jealousies, verse 20, the previous chapter, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, whispering, conceit, tumults. Sounds like the First Baptist Church of every place. It's drama. He's writing to them to challenge them to say, I wonder how many of you are truly born again? How many of you really have a relationship with God? And I think that's a pertinent question that everybody who's going to church need to ask themselves. Because it's as quiet as it is kept, everybody who goes to church is not saved. And I think it's important that I spend a few moments talking about that because I don't want anybody who is at the First Baptist Church of Glenarden to think that just because your name is on the roll of First Baptist that that means your name is on heaven's roll. I just want to be clear. I want there to be some clarity about it that I don't want you to think that just because you got baptized here or just because you're taking communion tonight or because you're singing the choir or you're an usher, or whatever you're doing, I don't want you to think that that qualifies you as automatically being in in the faith. Because being in the faith is qualified by more than just the fact that you got the right hand of fellowship. It's important. It's more than the fact that you joined the church or you serve in a ministry. We... We want you to make sure that you have, in fact, have a genuine relationship with the Lord. And so Paul says to them right here in this last and final letter, in the last chapter of his final letter to the corrupt, carnal church of Corinth, he says, it's about time that y'all examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Now, you know, it got to be pretty bad if he got to pull that card. And I done counseled a lot of people, and I done talked to a lot of people. And if I get to the place, I have to ask myself the question whether you truly saved, you know you are a jacked up joker. <laughs> if through the course of my counseling and talking to you, I don't see any evidence, I don't see any, any manifestation of any walk with God, any connection with God, and if I have to ask myself whether you are truly saved, that's really a problematic situation. And I wish I could tell you that everybody that I've ever sat down and counseled with that I never had that thought. But if the truth were to be told, I've had it on more than a few occasions. Don't worry, I'm not going to call your name out while I'm standing here. It is a, it is a true pertinent question that everybody needs to ask themselves. And what I want to do is walk you through the test. I want to walk you through the test. I want to walk you through some scriptures that will give you the test of evaluating whether or not you are really in the faith. 
Y'all supposed to say, go ahead, walk me through it, Pastor. Are y'all scared y'all might not pass the test? It's okay, if you don't pass the test when I give it, you have an opportunity to get it right tonight. Now, I, I, I grew up in church. I was raised in church. I, my mother bought me to church as a child. I, I, I grew up in church. I sang in United Voice Choir. I was an usher. I, I served the church, and I served the church for a long time. But nobody ever asked me if I was in the faith. It was just assumed that because I had joined the church and had been baptized and I was singing on the choir and I was an usher and I was in church every time the doors opened and I served in the church, it was just commonly understood that I was a Christian. But one day I realized that even through all of my religious activity and my involvement in church, I realized there was something missing deep down inside. And it was during that time that I, I began to cry out to God and I will never forget on a Tuesday night at a Methodist church on South Dakota Avenue in Washington, D.C., during a revival service, I decided to come forward and give my heart to Jesus. And I know people say, he's already a part of the First Baptist Church of Lenore, and he sings in the choir. But that night, I didn't care what anybody thought about me. The most important thing you can do is make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved. And whatever that takes to happen, you need to get that to happen to make sure that you're saved. It would be tragic for you to walk around thinking you're saved and then die and find out that you ain't saved. It will not be because the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Lenore did not challenge you in asking yourself whether you are truly in the faith. So what's the test? I'm glad you asked the question. As a matter of fact, I want you to go to 1 John chapter 1. Matter of fact, I got several verses for you tonight. But I'm going to start by looking at the threefold test that's mentioned in 1 John chapter 1. Now, it's not the Gospel of John, but it's the first epistle of John, page 1073 in my Bible. <laughs> it is chapter 1, and allow me to look at verses 5, 6, and 7, because it, in fact, gives the threefold test. Here's what verse 5 says. It says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. Here's the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, now this gives us an indication of what the first, qu the first question, the first test is. And here what it is, it's a question you, ask, you have to ask yourself. And the question is, what do you believe? Write that down. That's the question you have to ask yourself. Do you believe that God is light and in him is no darkness at all? Do you believe that God is the light of the world? Do you believe, this is what you got to ask yourself, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he's the light of the world? Do you believe Jesus was born of a virgin, died on the cross for our sins, was raised from the dead, and is coming again? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus? This is, this is the core of our faith, is that we really believe. I'm not just talking about that you put credence in the existence of Jesus. It is more than just believing that Jesus existed. The devil knows that Jesus existed. A lot of people know that Jesus existed, but do you believe he is the light of the world? Do you believe that he was born of a virgin? I talked on Christmas about how important it is to recognize and realize that he is born of a virgin. Why is that important? Because the Muslims believe he was born. The Muslims believe that Jesus existed and that he was a good prophet. That's what they believe. They accept him as a prophet. But they don't believe he was born of a virgin and they don't believe he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. They believe he was born and conceived by man. And the reason the virgin birth of Jesus is important is because the fact that he was born to a virgin, which means she didn't know a man, and that she was impregnated by the Holy Ghost would give him the qualifications by virtue of the fact that his blood is not like the rest of our blood to wash away our sins. You, you got to believe he was born of a virgin. You got to believe that he was crucified on the cross and took the whipping for our sins. God whipped him. Do you believe? What do you believe? Do you believe that what he did on the cross 
is sufficient enough to have your sins washed away? I mean, really, do you really, truly, deep down believe that? Why do I say that? Because some of y'all are trying to work your way into heaven. And if you think you could work your way into heaven, what you are in essence saying is what Jesus did on the cross is not good enough for my sins to be washed away. I'm not trying to work my way. My works cannot get me into heaven. My works are not good enough to get me there. I can only get to heaven by the blood of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for my sins. I got to believe that he died on my cross for my sins and he was buried. That burial part is important too because I say it again on Christmas. If you were here Christmas, forgive me for repeating myself, but it's worth saying it again and again and again that not only did he die on the cross for our sins, but he was buried. Why is that important? Because his burial means that when he went in the grave, he took our sins with him. Now, I know y'all were born saved and sanctified and Holy Ghost filled, and your sins ain't that big. But I messed up royally in the course of my life. And I'm glad to know that he took my sins and buried them and won't allow anybody else to come back and pull them back up again. That's why you got to be reminded that every time the devil tries to tell you about your past, you need to tell him about his future. You got to remind yourself, I might have done that, but that's not who I am. I did that back then, but I've been saved and forgiven now. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I have my shackles broken. I'm a brand new creation. Jesus has washed and taken all of my sins away. That's great news. Therefore, you don't have to feel guilt anymore. No more guilt. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You cannot let the enemy condemn you. If you don't know the Bible, the devil will condemn you about your past. And so many people are living a life full of guilt and shame because they, they can't get past their past but you got to get past your past and say I believe that he is the light of the world and there is no darkness in him so that means if he's in me there's no darkness in me look at your neighbor say there ain't no darkness in me and I have to believe not only that he died on the cross and that he was buried but here's the kicker here's what separates him from Buddha and Muhammad and Confucius and and all the others is that early Sunday he got up out of the grave. He's alive and well. He is real. He's alive. He conquered death. He, he defeated the devil and he got up out of the grave. And, and the question is, do you believe that? And not only did he get raised from the dead, but he is coming back again. If you really believed he was coming back again, you wouldn't keep living the way you live If you thought really in your heart that he might crack the sky tonight, you would have lived this week all differently than the way you lived it. Y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all ain't saying nothing. So that's the first test. What do you truly deep in your heart believe? Because your beliefs will dictate the second thing. Matter of fact, right here in verse, that's number five. Uh, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all that you have faith in him here's number, here's number two the question he says in verse six if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth here's the second question here's the second test what do you practice Did y'all notice how the amens got real quiet on that point? The text says, if you say you saved, if you say you have fellowship, but you walk in darkness, the Bible says you're a liar. Hmm. 
Whew, man, it's just, it is quiet up in here. And you're not practicing the truth. Jot these verses down. I don't have, I don't have time to turn to them, but 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. Let me read it. You can turn. It's just one, chip, one page over. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Can I read that for y'all real quick? It says, now this, by this we know that we know him. By this we know we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Do, do y'all notice he says the same thing twice? But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked, just as Jesus walked. In other words, this word practice, the key word, matter of fact, going back to verse 6, says that we say that we fellowship with him and walk in darkness. The, the key is the word walk, because that word walk, the key word of that walk means what's the ongoing pattern of your life? What is it that you do on a regular? What is it that you do continually? What's the pattern in your life? If you have a pattern of continuing to do something over and over and over and over and over and over again, no guilt, no, no conviction, if the Holy Ghost never talks to you, if, there, if there's nothing poking you in the side and say, leave that alone, nothing's talking to you and whispering you in your head to leave it alone, you better reinvestigate whether or not you are in the faith. Because what I believe and know is that when you have a relationship with God and the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, when you start practicing stuff you don't have no business practicing, the Holy Ghost starts bringing conviction in you. Starts talking to you. Starts saying, are you supposed to be talking to that person? Are you supposed to be watching that on television? Would you read that book that you read and look at those pictures in that magazine and or go to that website you're going to if Jesus was sitting right here next to you? I'm just taking a test. What do you practice? What's the routine that you've accepted in your life is acceptable? I, 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 don't, I don't, let me be clear, y'all. None of us are perfect. We all, we all got shortcomings and missed the mark. What I'm talking about, though, is what you have accepted. What you feel no conviction about. I believe the Holy Ghost will keep talking to you when you're doing something you ain't got no business doing. And, and you know what? Because the amens are getting fewer and fewer and fewer. I have a responsibility and a burden from God to challenge you on these things because I don't want you to think that you can keep just living any kind of way. And Because the church... You know, Paul, Paul raises question with them because they, back in Corinth, they knew the scriptures. But somehow they had reason in their mind and they were able to go past and bypass the scriptures and keep doing what they were doing. And Paul said, I can't believe y'all are calling yourselves the saints of the Most High God and that you have a relationship with him, but you are practicing the things that you're practicing. Paul said, let me do this, examine yourself. And that's what I want to say to you. Examine yourself, whether you're in, whether you're in the faith. I, I, just, I don't believe that if you have a relationship with God and uh, 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 you're walking with him, that he will allow you to keep doing the things that you're doing. Amen. It's one thing to fight to conquer sin. I, I, I admit somebody, I admire people who fight and toil to do right and they may fall down but they get back up and clean themselves off and do right. I'm bothered by the people who lay down in the mud and make it home and, and buy a couch and a TV and a table and put an address and welcome other people into their mess and talking about I'm only human. <laughs> you better get up out of here. You a child of the most high God. You got Jesus living inside of you. believe you can just keep shacking with somebody and be, call yourselves Christians. Talking about two clean sheets don't make no dirt. Yes, they do. I'm 
troubled by those adulterous relationships and, and those women hanging out with married men. I got trouble with that. I'm pro I got a problem with that. I don't, I don't want you to think that we are not a church that preaches holiness. We preach the holiness of God, that he calls you to live a holy life. You got to fight to live holy. And this is a war, and the devil's trying to get you on the wrong track. If you are a child of God, you got to do battle, and you got to get in Jesus. He will help you live holy. Anybody here know he'll shut the doors that you're trying to go through? Anybody know he'll cancel out your plans? I wish I had somebody here who know what I'm talking about, what he'll do for you. Can y'all go to, I'm still on this second point, what are you practicing? Go to 1 John 3. I want y'all, this is all right here in 1 John. 1 John 3, I'm, I'm almost finished. No, I'm not, let me not tell that lie. 1 John 3, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. Look, listen to it, 1 John 3, 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he, meaning Jesus, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Don't you know Jesus came to destroy the devil's power over you? You don't have to stay an addict. You don't have to stay in drugs. You don't have to stay an alcoholic. You don't have to stay a liar. You don't have to stay a fornicator. You don't have to stay an adulterer. You don't have to stay a homosexual. You can be free. Matter of fact, we got plenty of people here who can look back and see where God has freed them from. And if God did it for them, he'll do the same thing for you. Look at verse 9, right here, verse, verse 9 of, 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 of chapter 3 of 1 John. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Wow. In other words, you cannot make sin a practice and be comfortable with it. I'm troubled by people who can just divorce, get, just get out of the marriage and go on to another one. How many divorces are you going to go through and put no effort toward getting it right? Not fighting for your marriage, what you know? Don't y'all know divorce is a sin? Do y'all know that divorce is a sin? I would, never, I would never divorce my wife. I don't care what she did. No, I would maybe consider murder, but, but, but divorce? I actually shouldn't joke about that in this day and age. That's not the will of God. But we live in a culture that's made it okay. If you're going to be a member of this church, let me tell all 108 new members of our church that we got coming here tonight, and all of all of you who are members of this church, we stand for righteousness. Don't come in to me and expect me to sign off on your plans to divorce. I don't care what they did. They're not beyond the ability of the power of God to transform and change them. You ain't been holy all your life. Let me close. Y'all don't like, I know y'all, ain't nobody bought nothing up here, no, no nothing. Did I miss it or something? Because I am preaching, I'm telling y'all right now, I am preaching. You're not gonna stand before God and say, I didn't tell you. Here's, here's number three. Here's the final thing. I got to hurry up. Did y'all get number one? What's the first test? What do you believe? What's the second test? 
Here's the third one. Let's go back to 1 John 1 and read verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The third question is, how do you get along with others? Ooh, that's, a, that's tight right there too. Because if you walk in the light, I didn't make this verse up. I didn't put it here. It was here when I got here. He gives us the ability to fellowship with one another. If you can't get along with nobody, and if you don't like nobody, you better reinvestigate whether or not you're in the faith. Because one of the byproducts of a relationship with God is that he gives you the desire and love for other believers. Don't, don't tell me that you are a child of God and you don't like to be around church people. Because church people just like you, see there's a new movement of people who don't want to go to church. They talk about they can worship God at home. And that's fine, yeah, we all ought to worship God at home, but the Bible also teaches that you ought to fellowship with others. Let me tell you, you know why you need the church? We need the church because you cannot become what God wants you to become by yourself. God uses the church and the gifts that he has placed in the church to help make you everything that he wants you to be. You, you can't do it by yourself. You need somebody to get in your grill when you ain't doing the right things. And you need somebody to pray with you when you get discouraged and frustrated. You need somebody to teach you the word of God when you misinterpret in the word of God. You need somebody to hold you accountable when you don't have nobody to hold you accountable. You need somebody to lift your spirits when you are down and depressed and sorrowful. You, I don't know about y'all, I need the church. I love the church. And I love the people in the church. I love the church. I love God's people with all of my heart, not because I'm the pastor, I've loved God's people since I got saved. I grew up in the church. I stuck with the church. I got hurt by a lot of church people. A lot of church people did me wrong. And, but, but my love for the rest of the people <laughs> kept me in there, even though there's some people who got on my last nerves. I will never let one or two people run me away from the house of Almighty God. Here's what 1 John 2, 9 says. 1 John 2, 9, that's just the next chapter where I'm at. Verse 9, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even now. If you say you're in the light but you hate somebody, you, you, know, you know how I know I'm saved? I know I'm saved because God will give you the capacity to love somebody that you know don't like you. Can I get an amen right there from anybody? Here's what 1 John chapter 3 says, verse 14 and 15. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. He say, right here, we know that we have passed from death to life. How do we know we've passed from death to life? Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Here, here, here's how you know. Here's the test. You know that you are saved because God has given you the capacity to love people, even those that you know that are unlovable. I want you to take the test. I want you to ask yourself, what do you really believe? If you got questions about what you believe, you should cry out to God and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What's your practice in life? What is it that you've accepted 
as a normal that you know is sin, that the Bible clearly teaches as sin, but yet you've gotten comfortable with it. I'm challenging you to reinvestigate and examine your faith because if you got something going on in your life that's not right, the Holy Ghost, if he lives in you, he would be bringing some stress in your life. And finally, number three, how do you get along with other people? Do you love people? Ask yourself that question. There's some folk you can't get along that you're making a maze in the church to keep from talking to. You better reinvestigate yourself. Lean over, tell your neighbor, he preaching better than you're saying amen. <laughs> Lean over and tell the other person, he teaching and preaching, show sure enough now. I, I took longer than I planned to, but forgive me, I'm sorry. But I want to challenge you. Stop coming to church and jumping and shouting and raising your hand and you know you ain't loving somebody. Sit down. Stop coming to church and worshiping the Lord and you know you're doing something you ain't got no business doing. Sit down. Because if you really believe, if you truly believe, it will be affected and demonstrated in what you practice and how you treat other people. Yeah. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. It's so crystal clear, crystal clear. It calls us to be people who will examine ourselves. Help us to be people who will examine ourselves. In Jesus' name. I pray now, Father, in your name, that if there's somebody here tonight that's not right, give them the courage, the humility to say, I need to get right with God. Somebody's not saved. Somebody's backslidden and drifted away. Somebody's unsure. Somebody needs a church home. They're saved, but they don't have a church. They need the church. The devil has convinced them they don't need the church, perhaps. God, draw them now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Praise the Lord. Help me give the Lord one more last shot.